Kofi Annan at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. Welcome to Hard Talk. Happy to be here with you. Thank you. So um, you've had a very busy retirement since you left the United Nations. Do you think that the world is a more troubled place today than it was when you left the UN? First of all, I've discovered retirement is hard work. <laughs> <laughs> but one has to keep at it. I think uh, I went through difficult moments at the UN. You've referred to some of them, including the Iraq war. But the world is particularly messy today when we look at what is happening in the Middle East, what is happening in some parts of Africa, some parts of Asia, and also the fact that I don't see the strong leaders around who could cope with it. So you don't you think there are strong have some... leaders in the world today? I mean, there's Donald Trump in the White House, and <laughs> he's making very strong, robust statements about Syria now, for instance, saying yeah. that the suspected chemical attack in Douma that we've just seen recently killing dozens of people, including children, yeah. needs a robust response. Yeah, different people have different definitions of leadership. <laughs> I, I... <laughs> I believe that leadership is not about the individual. When you have macho leaders who believe they have to shine and it all has to be about them, forgetting that what is interest, what is required is the welfare of society and the people they serve. Are you referring to Donald Trump, though? Because when you look at what's happened in Syria, so many people mm. were appalled by that recent attack, and we saw one sure. also last year. And, you know, he referred to Bashar al-Assad, president of Syria, as an animal, as an animal, mm. as a gas-killing animal. Yeah. And he has said, we've got to have a response, get ready for nice, new, smart missiles in Syria. I don't approve of that. Not only don't I approve of that, this, I, I like the Secretary General's position. He said, what is required General of the UN, Antonio of the UN, Antonio Guterres, said, what is required is unfettered investigation to determine who was responsible, hold them to account, and ensure that impunity is not allowed to stand. And we, the elders, the elders issued a statement which I, as chairman, share very much, that what we need is uh, cool heads and sober judgment. We cannot allow situations where leaders threaten war on television or on Twitter. Do we base ourselves on facts or speed? We've seen this before. We had investigations in, in Iraq, which was not allowed to get to decisive uh, conclusion. And we were informed. We know there were weapons of mass use, but we know this story now. I, I think the main thing is we need to have a strategic view. Is military, uh, military action alone the solution? Would there have to be a better strategy apart from that of also getting the council and everybody to come together to resolve the Syrian crisis once and for all? I think it is much more important to push them to work together, the West and the East, the international group that is the council, the regional powers, and the Syrians to find a solution. But you know yourself, you were special envoy in 2012 to Syria for mm. both the United Nations mm. and the Arab League. You tried to come up with a plan, political process, um, humanitarian help and so on, and you gave up. You resigned. That's correct. Because it's a tough thing to do to try to get a, a workable strategy. I, I had hoped that my resignation would have sent a powerful message to the council that you have to work together and speak with one voice. But it didn't, did it? Yeah. And the situation's just got worse and worse, around half a million dead, 12 million displaced or are refugees. Objectively, it's much worse yeah. now than it was in 2012. And I think 2012, the ball was dropped after the Geneva communique, which was not followed up properly when they went back to New York. Do you think that you were perhaps duped when you were in that role? Did yeah. you realise it was a front at the time, that you might have just been used as a diplomatic no, I facade? Wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was a front in the same, but I do say that I lost my troops on the way to Damascus because I told the council this is an impossible task, but we can make a difference if we work together and you stay united. At the early stages, they did stay united, they did come up 
with joint statements and all that, but eventually fell apart. And I realized that I was perhaps much more serious about peace in Syria than they were. Well, the Syrian conflict has shown, of course, um, that there are it is a rivalry between the United States and Russia, both backing different partners. Russia, of course, supporting Bashar al-Assad. But now relations between the two are at their lowest step. Some commentators say mm -hmm. possibly the worst since um, the Cold War. Are you worried that this rivalry between Moscow and Washington could escalate now? I am concerned about it. I am worried. I think they have to find a way of engaging in a calm way and preferably behind the scenes. The sort of language that is being thrown around uh, coming from leaders is, is really unimaginable. I mean, it's interesting to hear people in your profession, journalists, saying we are trying to make sense out of all this noise. And they are not talking about noise from the streets. They are talking about noise from governmental headquarters, from the offices of presidents. This is unusual, you know, and uh, in, in a way, some of the things we are witnessing today, if it had happened in a third world country, using that sort of language in the days of Idi I mean, the lectures we would have received. What kind of language? I mean, I tell you, Mike Pompeo, the CIA director who's set to become the next U.S. Secretary of State, has signaled that years of soft U.S. policy towards Russia, he says it's now over and Russia is a danger to our country. Is that the kind of thing you're referring to? That's the kind of thing I'm referring to. And from Moscow, similar rhetoric? Yeah, and, and the, these are mature leaders. They should find a way of communicate. I mean, I'm not sure in the end, at the end of the day, the people they are trying to impress are really impressed by this sort of language. People want leadership. They want to be led in the proper direction. They want vision. Uh, and so for, a lead, for leaders to think that you have to flex your muscles to show you are powerful and you're a leader, isn't it? No. So that's the United... Yeah. I assume there you're talking about Donald Trump, President Trump of, one, of the United States. Uh, he has a special language for diplomacy. All right. But what, <laughs> but what about Russia, which of course has attracted a lot of criticism for supporting Bashar al-Assad? I mean, do you see Russia as, as a danger? Honestly, I believe that there are so many proxy wars going on in, in Syria that some of the fighting going on has nothing to do with the Syrians. Mm. Uh, so we should be careful not to point fingers on the other Russians. There are quite a few other players in, in, in the theater. So, you know, here we are talking about Syria, as I said, about 12 million people displaced or are mm. refugees. But if you look at what's going on in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, mm. similar number of people yeah. displaced, um, terrible violence, particularly in the Kivu region. And, um, it, you know, it's not got as much attention yeah. as Syria. Shouldn't you, as arguably the best known African, most mm -hmm. widely admired African mm -hmm. currently in the world, shouldn't you be speaking about the DRC every day of the week? No, what is happening in DRC is, is very tragic. Attempts have been made to get the government to cooperate. There are so many envoys operating in, K in uh, Congo today, I'm not even sure I can list them all. Situations like Congo indicates the limit to international pressure and international influence. And we need to find a way of strengthening the local population and lo local civil society uh, to take on the fight and to work with them. But you know, you said, oh, there are lots of envoys there, but there are 16,000 mm -hmm. UN stabilization forces in the DRC, a country the size of Western Europe. Mm -hmm. So that really, they're not going to be able to be very, very effective. Jan Egeland, the head of the mm -hmm. Norwegian Refugee Council says, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is one of the worst crises on earth, yet no one seems to care about it. Yeah. Is he right? And why do you think it doesn't count? Is it because they're Africans? There, there could be a bit part of that. And also the fact that uh, it's a crisis that had gone on for a long time. The first UN presence in the Congo dates back to 1960. And we've been there almost continuously uh, till now. So there is a bit of uh, fatigue. And there was also real leadership crisis 
uh, in in the Congo. So, I mean, I, I said that you know you're you're arguably the best known African today, and of course you were the first black African to become head of the United mm. Nations. And when you were at the UN for a career that, that mm. went over six decades, you were head of UN peacekeeping operations. But I put it to you that in your time, the U UN Charter's aim was not met, particularly mm -hmm. pertaining to Rwanda. Mm -hmm. We saw the Rwanda genocide happen when you were head of U UN peacekeeping operations. The Charter's aim is to save succeeding generations from the scourge mm -hmm. of war. It failed the people of Rwanda, didn't it? No, you, you can argue that we failed the people of Uganda. Rwanda. We failed Rwanda. And we failed the people of uh, Bosnia, as you mentioned earlier. I think what, what is important here when we talk of the UN, we have to be very clear which UN we are talking about. There are two UNs in my judgment, which there is a UN that is made up of the member states who sit in the Security Council, who are the P5, who also are in the General Assembly, give the Secretary General and the Secretariat its mandates and the commensurate resources to carry out the mandate. And then there is a UN under the Secretary General which implements uh, the program. In Rwanda, it was extremely difficult to get the member states to move. First of all, Rwanda came soon after Somalia when the American planes had been shot down and they were all rushing home. The US withdrew and all the Western countries withdrew with the US. It was about the same time that Rwanda, which at that point people had thought was doing well, fell apart. And no one wanted to send troops in, even when we said increase the troops which were there. But when did you it. become aware? I have to ask you, there were numerous warnings mm -hmm. from people on the ground in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. You must have received at least 10 warnings. For example, General Romeo Dallaire, yeah. head of the UN peacekeeping mission in Rwanda, in November 1993, alerted mm -hmm. you to the possibility of what might happen, and yet you got no response. I think, first of all, Romeo Dallaire is a good friend and a very good officer. Romeo Dallaire, when he sent that message to my military advisor, indicated that it is also possible that it is a trap, that they uh, could walk into a trap with this warning. Not only that, soon after that, 10 Belgian soldiers were also killed. Mm -hmm. The member states were not ready to send in troops. And, and in this situation, when you say the UN failed, which UN are you talking I, about? I'm asking you really, because yeah. I mean, yeah. in, in January, yeah. you received a cable from General Romeo Dallaire, mm. who said he wanted approval to use force against what he described as crimes against humanity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, Jacques Roger Boubou, the UN Special mm -hmm. Envoy to Rwanda, mm -hmm. also said that he was, he said, in view of Rwanda's long and tragic history of ethnic conflict, the possibility of ethnically motivated incidents is a constant threat. Mm -hmm. There were these things no, that were coming to you, January, yeah. February, yeah, but and, and how did you respond? Because they say they didn't get no, the reaction he did. They he wanted. was on the line with our military advisor all the time, and also. And you? And you? I I didn't. He came to New York to talk to me. Uh, we brought him back for consultation. But what is important, what you should hear, is that not everything that comes from the field is that you jump on immediately. I see. First of all with 250 soldiers, 2,500 soldiers, even if you used half of them to try to stop this, they would have been slaughtered the way the Americans were. No, that's wait, not wait, what he no, told, no. He let, told let, Hard let Talk, though, in let. 2002, General Dallaire, he said that he could have stopped the genocide with 5,000 peacekeepers. They tied my hands because they were gun shy. But he did not have the 5,000 soldiers. No, he had two and a half thousand. He had, he had two and a half, and he would, they would have been the first, in, you know, the first attack, just to kill 10 or 15, mm. the member states would want to withdraw their but troops. But did you not say, The way Kirtian, the Amer Americans withdrew in Somalia. Sure, but did you not say on January the 10th, in a cable, back to 
Delaire and Boo Boo, we must handle this information with caution. Mm -hmm. And you said no reconnaissance or other action should be taken until there is clear guidance from headquarters. It seems like you were almost suggesting that they were exaggerating what might be going on on the ground. But even if they were not as exaggerating, you needed to think through the implications of the action they were contemplating. It was evident that they did not have the resources to take on the challenge they were confronted with. I mean, you talked of 18,000 UN troops in Congo, 16, a drop 000, in the yeah. pocket, you know, and often the UN has made those mistakes in the past. We put in these small numbers of soldiers who are not okay. always well equipped. They are too big to hide and they are too small to make a difference. And that is a terrible sort of uh, awkward situation. But how did you same. feel once you realized the, I mean, I mean, those of us, those of killed. All, no, all of us who worked in that period were really shattered by the experience. And that's why I pushed for the uh, approval of responsibility to protect. Because that concept of responsibility to protect, which states that if a country is not in a position or unwilling to protect its population, the international community has a responsibility sure. to go in. Because before then, you can say this is a, a question of sovereignty. We have not been invited. We are not going to sure, join. Sure, you checked. That was yeah. a, a landmark uh, achievement yeah. there. But the UN report to the Security Council at the end of May 1995, and the mm -hmm. genocide took place April 94, said on the UN mission there, we must all realise that we have failed in our response to the agony of mm -hmm. Rwanda and have thus acquiesced in the continued loss of human lives. Do you feel you've acquiesced in those deaths? I don't think we are acquiesced, but we were helpless. I don't think we are acquiesced. If you use the word acquiesce, you are implying that the 2,500 troops there could have stopped the genocide. So you don't feel you've acquiesced, but all right, let me ask but, you but this. We then. We was it, you had a long, distinguished career at the United Nations. Was that the lowest point in your career, would you say? For, for me, as it, being in the peacekeeping department, and also being an African coming from the continent and not being able to do something to, to help. But I want to use the word acquiesce. I said, I will, I, we did fail. And you said, never again. Mm -hmm. Everybody said that. And yet, 1995, the year after mm -hmm. Rwanda, around seven to 8,000 Bosnian mm -hmm. Muslim men and boys mm -hmm. were killed by Serbs at, its, at Srebrenica. And again, the United Nations criticised for failing to prevent the massacre. No, it's always easy to find a scapegoat. The UN, in fact, I used to say that the, the letters SG does not stand for Secretary General, it stands for scapegoat. <laughs> can, you can scapegoat the Secretary General and the UN even when the resources required are not made available. But it's the own UN's report in yeah. 1999, That's when you were by then Secretary yeah. General, that was scathing in its criticisms of the UN. Yeah. It said, had UN troops engaged the attacking Serbs directly, it is possible that events would have unfolded differently. It may have. But you it's know, the, own, the UN's own report is critical of the UN. I so, released so that the UN report. Fit for, yeah, you released it. Is the UN <laughs> fit for purpose? I think the UN... In today's world? No, UN can be improved. Uh, it's not perfect, but if it didn't exist, you would have had to create it. I think what it is is uh, the, the, we need to look at the, how the UN acts, the UN structure, the decision-making processes, where, whether in the Council or in the General Assembly. Of course, but, I know you worked very hard to try to reform the Security Council good. and to expand its membership, permanent mm -hmm. seats for Japan, Africa, India, that kind of thing. Let me put to you what John Soares, former MI6 mm. intelligence chief and former and British former ambassador, ambassador yeah. to the UN said just recently, we're seeing a reversion to a great power world where the multinational institutions that we built up after 1945 are becoming less effective. There is more competition, partly because of the politics that is leading to big man leaders like Trump, Putin and Xi Jinping, Erdogan and others. Is that where we're heading, you think? Less relevance for institutions like the UN yeah. and more focus on the big man? I, I think it, it appears we are heading that way, but I hope the pendulum will swing back. 
I think these strong leaders will come to understand that the approach they are taking doesn't work. We live in such an interdependent world and we have so many issues that no one country can resolve, however powerful that country is. There's also something happening here. There's a shift, a shift taking place in terms of power shifting to other regions, Asia and China in particular. And that is very difficult for some uh, in places like America mm. to accept, but it's irreversible. The trend will continue and we have to find a way of dealing with it. Where do you think American foreign policy is heading? You just mentioned America there because, you know, we've seen John Bolton, the new national security advisor, a man you yeah. remember when you were at the UN, yeah. he was yeah. American ambassador to the United Nations, famously said you could blow up 10 floors of the UN mm -hmm. and nobody would notice the difference. Mm -hmm. not, not getting rid yeah. of people, but in terms of its, mm -hmm. its mandate yeah. and what it achieves. They tear up the Iran Accord, they've got to May the 12th to decide. That would, be, that would be very dangerous. And I hope if US, I hope that if the US were to pull out next month, I hope the other parties to the agreement, the Europeans and the Iranians, will stick together and let U.S. decide to isolate itself. It will be disruptive, it will cause problems, and, and you are going to tear up the Iran agreement at the same time as you're going to talk to the North Koreans. What, what uh, incentive do they have to, to, to talk or come to an agreement when they know you can tear it up mm. the way you are tearing up the Iranian agreement? Which of the big men do you fear the most? I, I don't fear any of the big men. I worry about them in our world. <laughs> I, I worry about them in our world and the problems they can cause uh, for us. Honestly, when I refer to the need for uh, cool heads and sober judgment, I really am talking to all of, the, all of them. So who you are, you've turned 80. When are you going to finally retire? <laughs> I hope Nan didn't plant that question. That's your wife. That's your wife. <laughs> that's my wife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a constant debate. What's your answer to her and to us? I, I, t I keep promising that I will slow down, but I don't think she believes me anymore. <laughs> but, but it will come. <laughs> Kofi Annan, thank you very much indeed for coming on Hard Talk.